Somalia hopes to restore stability by electing a new president. It's been labeled a failed state for a quarter of a century. But is electing a new leader enough? And why does Somalia matter for the region and the world? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the program. I'm Hazem Seekham. It was an unusual presidential election with 22 candidates and no polling stations. Members of parliament voted, but nobody else because of the threat of attack from the armed group Al-Shabaab. The election process has been marred by accusations of bribery and political infighting among the clans of Somalia, all 135 of them. So will the new president be able to lead Somalis through the many political and security challenges? We'll get to our guests in a moment, but first, Mohamed Ado reports from Mogadishu. Voting is underway in Somalia's much-awaited presidential elections, elections that are crucial to the future of this country that is slowly recovering from 30 years of civil war and conflict. These elections are not uh, one man, one vote elections. There is a general feeling across Somalia that Somalia is not yet ripe for universal elections because of the massive insecurity being waged by the group Al Shabaab. The group also controls large parts of uh, southern Somalia. Um, just before the voting got underway, there were 22 candidates, but one of them withdrew from the race, citing that there's been a massive external interference in the electoral process. However, these are not the only allegations surrounding the process of the elections. There are claims of corruption and voter bribery with some of the MPs actually owning up to receiving between $50,000 and $100,000 for their votes, money being paid by some of the candidates. However, Many Somalis hope that the MPs, the 329 of them who will be doing the voting instead of the Somali public, will use their conscience and think about the massive problems bedeviling this country and vote in someone who can actually bring about change to this country and change for the better. Mohamed Ado Al Jazeera, Mogadishu for Inside Story. Now, Somalia's history tells a story of instability and insecurity. Longtime leader Mohamed Siad Barre was overthrown in 1991, which led to a decade long civil war between clan warlords. It took 13 attempts before Somalia inaugurated a stable transitional government in Kenya. But as it tried to end the civil war, Al Shabaab began its violent campaign against the government, making war and famine worse. Surrounding nations were compelled to join the fight. Kenyan troops entered Somalia for the first time in 2011. Ethiopian troops had already been fighting there for around 15 years. In 2012, Somalia's first formal parliament and president were sworn in. For the first time in 20 years, there was a possibility of having a central government. And Shabab began attacking surrounding nations to discourage their interventions. In September 2013, gunmen killed 67 people in the Westgate shopping mall in Nairobi. And two years later, 148 mainly Christian students were shot and killed in Kenya's Garissa University College. Threats from Al-Shabaab continue to plague Somalia today, hindering its chances for political stability. So let's bring in our guest now. Joining us here in the studio is Afiare Elme. He is a Somali political scientist and associate professor in international affairs at Qatar University. In Nairobi, we have Matt Bryden. He is the chairman of the Sahan Research Institute in Kenya. He specializes in Somali political and security issues. And joining us from London, Hawa Hassan, who is a former Somali minister. Welcome, all of you. Um, now, Afiare, if I could start with you this is an election that uh, only uh, members of parliament can can vote in and it is taking place um, in the airports of, of the capital under very high security that's that what are the optics of that I mean that that tells its own story about the state of affairs in Somalia doesn't it yes it tells uh, actually and 
it, it's not good. It doesn't look good at all. It shows uh, the embryonic stage of the institutions, the state institutions in particular, uh, where at the moment Somalia's I mean, security forces or uh, political institutions are not functioning well. It also tells the limited progress that the current uh, government has made for the last four years. Uh, expectation was the beginning that they would lead the country into one person, one vote. And today uh, we are in, at the airport at the protection of the Amazon. And interestingly, even last night there were, I mean, uh, shellings and uh, all kinds of, I mean, explosions that took place. So it shows that the limited security progress that Somalia has made for the last four years, it also tells that the institutions have a long way to go at the moment, and definitely this is not good for optics. Uh, Matt Bryden, what's your take on this? I if there is um, limited progress, it is nevertheless some sort of progress, isn't it? Well, it is, and I, I, although I, I agree with uh, with my friend uh, Professor Elmi, um, I think uh, we also have to look beyond Mogadishu. And although the federal institutions that were established four years ago have made very limited progress, and security in Mogadishu still remains precarious, um, if there has been a major change, it's that we've seen administrations growing uh, beyond Mogadishu. Somalia adopted. Uh, by no means by consensus, but it has adopted a federal architecture. And we see the embryonic federal member states emerging uh, elsewhere in the country. And uh, that is really where I think we have seen some progress in the last four years, um, rather than in, say, the institution building at the federal level. Hawa Hassan, as a former uh, minister in, in the Somali government, um, how do you see the state of, state of affairs there right now? I mean, I, I guess, as I said in, in, in advance by email, to respond to this question efficiently and, and, and obviously correctly, the security authority has to be here today to respond um, in their view about this. I mean, from my perspective, what I see what I saw in Somalia when I was there and how it developed and things that was done in the, in the last four years, I think, I think the issue of security is still there, but something was done. And it's getting better day by day. And the issue that now we are, we are tackling is not only Al-Shabaab problems in Somali security issues, and there's other elements that need to be taken into account. So I have very limited things to say about the security, but I guess an, an improvement is there. Improvement is there. Um, Afiare Elmi, how, how, how representative are um, the, the, the members of parliament in Somalia of, of all of the... Somali people. I mean, there is talk that it's it's very, it's very clan based, um, and and that it's it's kind of tribally based. But is that is that representative of, of the people? Well, uh, I think when we talk about representation, one can say that uh, literally all almost all of the sub clans and clans are for. I mean, in one way or another, or a member from that clan is in the parliament. If you want to put it that way, does that mean a genuine representation? A representation, if we just look at it as something that basically uh, at the collectivistic, clanistic model, then one can say that there, there are some representations uh, happening. Uh, whether that would lead, lead to a legitimacy is another question. Uh, because the process at the moment was basically a process that was married by corruption, married by intimidation, manipulations, and all kinds of things. So I, I think, uh, yes, if you want, to, there are two, 329 uh, members that came from 329 subclans in one way or another. And one can say that all the Somali subclans and clans are included in the parliament. The process that these people were selected, however, has, uh, uh, has its own uh, shortcomings. And I think that's where we need to look. At times, we have seen that, uh, and, and this has been happening for a while, representation without uh, legitimacy and representation without functionality, that even if you 
put together people from different clans, and if they don't function as an institution, then what does that say to? So basically, yes, there is some representation if you want to put Somali, or if you want to look Somali in the clan lenses, but if you look other ways, like for instance, gender issues, where just only 20 or 24 percent are, are female, or youth, or I mean, other sectors of society, civil society, intellectuals, then one can say that perhaps we have, uh, we have a way to go. Matt Bryden, do you think that the, the, the focus on, on um, uh, kind of this kind of clan-based power sharing in Somalia is, is what is hindering its progress at the expense of, of uh, the, the main issues like uh, security and, and uh, fiscal responsibility and all of the economic problems? I, I don't think we can reduce everything to clan and, and, and blame the lack of progress on, on clan. We're, we are stuck where we are. Um, Somalia's adopted a clan-based power-sharing formula um, a number of years ago. It, it remains up to the present. And I think everybody would like to move beyond it uh, to something that is more representative. But what has to happen first is an agreement on what the new representational formula is going to be. And this government, which had four years in which to start thinking through uh, what uh, an electoral system might look like, um, really didn't make any progress. Um, and what we have now, what's going on at the moment, is not actually um, an election per se. It is a political agreement reached by um, the federal government and the emerging federal member states. Some would, would perhaps even describe them as factions. Um, it is an ad hoc compromise to get us to the next phase, and it'll be up to the incoming government um, to try to carry the transition forward, uh, figure out what the next, you know, the, the next representational formula looks like to take us a step away from clan, and, uh, and also to review the constitution and, and fix the security sector and all of the other transitional tasks that are still waiting to be accomplished. How Hassan, how, how credible um, are the main candidates uh, in this election, including the incumbent uh, uh, President Hassan Sheikh uh, uh, Mahmoud, given, all, given the limited progress that's been made so far and all of these uh, allegations of, of corruption and, and vote buying and so on? I mean, I was part of Hassan Sheikh and government, first of all, and I was part of that. And I, I'm, I have a first-hand experience of what was happening in Somalia. I mean, there's a lot of allegation going on in Somalia. If you see the reason behind these allegations, sometimes there is, there is other reasons rather than what it looked like to be. I mean, some people can make an allegation out of things because they didn't get what they wanted to get it, or some people because they have a um, kind of um, um, an ambition to, to be somewhere or to do something. They need to create a lot of allegations. So unless we have a proof, I think we need to just forget about the allegation for, for, the, for the time being. We need to have a proof really to, to condemn people and say, this is what this person done, or this is what has been happening, and that, and, and so on and so on. So I, I will leave that. But in terms of credibility of the parliament that you were talking about before, I um, fairly agree with the first speaker on that, because in at least I would, I can, again, this, and I was in Baidabo, I was part of the people who were looking to get a position of the parliamentarian in, in Somalia, the time that this thing was happening. At least over 50% in one area more than other are selected in a way that is not clear. So they were, there was a lot of uh, corruption was going on. People were, were given a position. They were told to select their people, uh, I mean, the um, uh, representatives. Anything is facilitated for them, whereas other people are going, are blocked. They were prevented from getting any opportunity to be part of the parliament. So in that sense, we can say, you know, uh, and some people are now about in the part of the parliamentarian position in Somalia came to the position in a way that is really um, and it's not legitimate. But then there's other people who are legitimate, they have legitimacy, they came clean, they were selected by the community and they came back. So in this 4.5, um, I mean, in, in, in tribe and system that Somali now is using, this is a way to get where we want to we wanna be in the next four years time and maybe 10 years time, and maybe 15 or, or, or 12 years time, what it's going to, I mean, how long it's going to take, no one knows, but hopefully we will get there. Everyone sees themselves within the system. It's an inclusive system. Whether that is some, the, the person representing them, whether the people or, or the community selected that person or they wanted that person to be representing them, that's another question. So in terms of gender equality, it's another issue in Somalia that equity in gender is not there. So hopefully it's going to be improving every now and then. 
Uh, Afiara Emni, we haven't talked about um, Al Shabab uh, up to this point, but as long as uh, uh, they remain a factor in uh, Somalia, then the people there are never going to see uh, security, are they? How, how do you deal with Al Shabab? Well, Al Shabab is there simply because the government is too weak. So it's a power I mean, vacuum. It's, taking it's of power vacuum. generally when we want. Depends on you know Al Shabab is just taking advantage of the weakness of the government. If anything is to happen in terms of improving security, then it's the government that needs to take that responsibility. They have to, uh, I mean, uh, at least monopolize the use of violence in the main centers, not necessarily the entire country. That's not what has happened. And we were talking about the credibility of the candidates at the moment. The top four candidates is that uh, might eventually move to the next round are former prime ministers and presidents. They have public profile. One can say that they have failed or they have, I mean, uh, succeeded. And if we are in the airport under the protection of Amisom, I'm sorry to say, I mean, I don't That's see... the African uh, Union force. Yeah, the African the Union force. There is no, I mean, achievements that uh, at least uh, that we can be proud of. I mean, yes, it's in Mogadishu, but w you see one, uh, two steps forward, three steps backward process that we have been going on for the past 15 years, since 2015. This is what is happening at the moment. Uh, uh, in my view, uh, when if Al-Shabaab is to be defeated, it's only Somali forces that can do that job. And Somali force has not been uh, instituted yet. What we have at the moment is clan, faction, whatever you call, uh, that exists at the moment in the name of so-called national forces. And it's the failure of the Somali political class, Somali political elite, the politicians that have been leading the country for the past, I mean, decade or so. Al-Shabaab will be there as long as the state is weak. Uh, Matt Bryden, if, 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 if these problems are ultimately going to be solved by Somalis themselves, uh, are um, foreign, uh, foreign forces like Amisom and, and Kenyan troops, are they, are they ultimately part of the problem here? Well, I, I'd have to agree with, uh, with Professor Elmi. I think um, ultimately this will have to be a Somali struggle against al-Shabaab. And uh, the African Union forces have done probably as much as they can do. Uh, they have secured some of the major municipalities, including Mogadishu, uh, which allows space for these embryonic administrations to sort of operate and grow and demonstrate their, their legitimacy if, um, if, if they have any and to exert their authority. Um, but it's not Amazon that's going to defeat al-Shabaab. That's going to be the job of Somali forces. And I would entirely agree that we have not seen the building of a Somali national army or an effective Somali national police force. Uh, what we have seen is an attempt to sort of monopolize forces in Mogadishu, uh, a black hole for donor resources being poured into the security sector. And um, in fact, most of the fighting is being done by paramilitary forces um, and, and clan militias out in the regions. Um, who are not being supported by the international community. So we really need to rethink the whole approach to uh, fighting al-Shabaab. Hawa Hassan, is that how you see it, that um, uh, the way to deal with al-Shabaab is, is to deal with uh, the, the, the problems that have, have led to their rise, the, the power vacuum uh, in those areas in Somalia that we've been talking about? Absolutely, absolutely. I agree with, with both of the speakers, because unless we, we build the capacity Somali force, Al-Shabaab is going to be there as long as they can. So international community has role to play in this. Somali government has role to play in this. The resources is an issue here. Somali government doesn't have enough resources to at least empower the, 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 the force, the, the military or the police force. And the capacity might be there for some time, but you need to have the resources to um, distribute that, to, to, you know, to build the capacity and to give the resources they need these forces to go against every insecurity that going in, is happening in Somalia right now. Whereas international community money, money goes towards um, Amazon, and if Amazon doesn't pass this capacity to Somali forces, we're going to be here in 100 years' time. So they have to think system building rather than delivering the service by themselves from now on. Uh, Afiara Emi, if we talk a little bit more about the um, foreign forces in, in Somalia, like, uh, like Amazon, um, there are many Somalis who complain that uh, uh, they are not really a force for good in the country that because of their heavy-handed tactics 
uh, in many areas um, and that they, they have made uh, the problem worse for, for many S Somalis and that's why some of them have, have fallen into the hands of, of Al-Shabaab. Uh, do you think there's much truth to that? Well, I think what uh, it, it's unfair to criticize. Uh, I mean, in in that way, one thing is quite clear that uh, Somali force is needed, and it's up to the Somali government and Somali leaders to build that. Uh, for now, these countries, I mean, some are coming from outside the neighbors, and some are coming from the neighbors. Kenya and Ethiopia, they are all pursuing their own interests. And that's, I mean, understandable in the sense that uh, they, some of them benefit from, uh, I mean, lack of uh, strong functioning state in Somalia. And maybe that's the status quo they want to keep. But as far as, I mean, I mean, for them staying there, it's not their job. In my, I, I, I would not criticize for not either defeating Al Shabaab or, I mean, they in fact overstayed. They were supposed to be here only about four or five years and then leave. And, and, and now, since 2007, as of now, almost uh, 10 years, they are still there. And it seems they will be there another five or, or 10 years. And it's up to the Somali government to do something about it meaningfully, I think. At the moment, we cannot just say that foreign forces are doing this or that. Nobody, no institution can function without them. If they leave Mogadishu tomorrow, what will happen? Then Al-Shabaab will take over, right? So what needs to happen is that we need the Somali leaders or Somali politicians to be accountable for what they promise and to be, I mean, uh, corruption free to work on, I mean, genuinely, that has not been happening for the past. So I think we should not be externalizing our shortcomings, at, as particularly the Somali elites, to, 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 to forces that are there uh, for just, you know, a period of time to, uh, to, 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 to seek for their own interests. And to me, I, it's international politics, it's real politics, they are just after their own interests. Matt Bryden, for the next, if the next, um Somali election, presidential election, is one in which Somalis, uh, ordinary Somalis, will be able to uh, to vote in. What needs to happen uh, to get to that point, in particularly in Mogadishu? I think there are essentially there are four things that the government is is tasked with, the provisional government is tasked with, um, and all of them have to happen. Um, Number one, uh, we need a constitutional review so that we actually have a basic law for the country that, that defines what the new Somalia looks like and uh, assuming that it's, it remains federal for the time being, uh, what the distribution of powers and, and responsibilities between the center and the federal member states uh, looks like, revenue sharing, natural resource ownership and management. All of these are very contentious and they have to be negotiated. Um, until they are, the relations between the center and the periphery are going to be strained and we're not going to have a cohesive Somali polity to um, come together and to push back against Al-Shabaab or any other threat that might come. Uh, we also need an electoral system, and I don't just mean an electoral law. Um, it's, it's not just Somalia, but any country emerging from conflict, and this is now uh, almost three decades of conflict that Somalia has witnessed, um, is deeply divided, and a hastily prepared, poorly run election could divide the country even more um, and possibly undo some of the progress we've seen over the last decade. So I think a lot of thought has to go into what that uh, democratization process looks like. And then there's security, and, uh, and I have to agree uh, again with Professor Elmi, I think um, uh, it's Somewhere between 50 and 100,000 Somali uniformed security personnel have been trained since 2004, and we don't see the impact on the ground. Um, we haven't seen great improvements over the last few years. We have got to rethink what the Somali security sector is going to look like, um, building it from those forces that are actually legitimate, accepted by communities, fighting al-Shabaab, um, and not just trying to, to reconstruct some... Um, idealistic vision of the, the Somali National Army or police from, you know, 30 years ago. All right. And on that note, we're going to have to uh, leave. It should be fascinating to see how this does play out. Uh, uh, Afyare Elmi joining us here in uh, Doha, Matt Bryden and Hawa Hassan in Nairobi and London. Thanks very much for being with us. Thank you. And thank you for watching. As always, you can see this program again anytime 
by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, you can go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And you can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle there is at AJ Inside Story. For me, Hazem Seeker and the whole team here, bye for now.